I just decided to go ahead, inshallah. Mute. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for joining us today with the Islamic Institute of Toronto. Um, we are really happy to have you. The IIT really does uh, miss you uh, and they miss uh, having you uh, with us, gathered with us either for Juma or for our programs. And so we hope that you continue to join us for all of our programs. Today we have a very special guest with us for the Great Books of Islamic Civilizations. Um, we have Dr. Catherine Bullock with us today. She is a lecturer at the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Her teaching focus is political Islam from a global perspective, and her research focuses on Muslims in Canada, their history, contemporary lived experiences, political and civic engagement, debates on the veil, and media representation of Islam and Muslims. She was the editor of the American Journal of Islamic Social Sciences from 2003 to 2008, the Vice President of the Association of Muslim Social Scientists from 2006 to 2009, and her publications include Muslim Women Activists in North America, Speaking for Ourselves, Rethinking Muslim Women in the Veil, Challenging Historical and Modern Stereotypes, which has been translated to a variety of languages. She is also the President of the Teslit Institute, a nonprofit research institute and of Compass Books dedicated to publishing top quality books about Islam and Muslims in English. She's originally from Australia. She lives in Oakville with her husband and children um, and she embraced Islam in 1994. And we are really happy to have her today to speak about uh, the topic, uh, Great Books of Islamic Civilization. This is a session that runs every single month. And this uh, term, we're going to be focusing on the greatest book uh, ever, and that is the Quran itself. This session, Dr. Kathy Bullock will explore Western discourses on the Quran. And we're really excited to have her today. And we hope that you join us uh, with IIT, with uh, the other upcoming courses as well. Uh, Jazakallah, Kathy Bullock. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Sajda, for such a lovely introduction. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Surviving lockdown, may Allah make it easy for us and relieve the burden and hardship that many of us are facing. Am I, are we starting? I'm yes. starting? Yes. I begin in the name of Allah, testify that there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet and messenger. I, I begin by acknowledging that we are living and working on indigenous land that was taken away unjustly by both British and French colonization. And Muslims know very well the ravages of colonization. And I think that as uh, newcomers to this land, it's part of our responsibility to be involved in the project for restorative justice to the indigenous peoples of Canada. I have a tech question. Is my slideshow up? It is up, yes, we can see okay, it. Please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We'll just wait a couple more seconds. We've had some tech issues. To understand the history of the way that the West has interpreted the Quran, I want to share with you a beginning that you might find surprising. I think that one of the best ways to understand it is contained in a verse in Surah al ankabut the spider, which is verse, uh, chapter 29, verse 46, and it goes like this. And do not argue with the people of the scripture except in a way that is best, except for those who commit injustice among them and say, we believe in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you. And our God and your God is one, and we are Muslims in submission to him. Why would I start this talking about a Quranic verse? Well, this verse teaches us how we should receive the scriptures of other faith, which in fact is the opposite of how the Quran has been received throughout much of Western history. If you've ever wondered why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala includes this instruction in the Quran, then the unpleasant history of how the Quran was discussed in Christendom shows us. And because without such godly guidance and wisdom, we find that mercy as a necessary ingredient of international relations, it's easy for humanity to fall into arrogance and spitefulness to a group that's designated as the other. We know that Muslims feel that the mainstream Western media demonizes Islam and Muslims. And this negativity is actually rooted in centuries old demonization of the Islamic religion. 
most specifically on the attacks on Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the recitation he brought the Quran. Tonight, I'm going to focus on mostly about the Quran. I'm going to tell you some stories about how and why it was translated and interpreted, and my focus is medieval Christendom. Overall, I was surprised at the nastiness which the text of this Quran was approached. And I'm going to talk about three things. One, what did they know in medieval times about the Quran? Why were they studying it? And three, what were the main themes that they came up with? So next slide, please. You might think that back in the 7th century and the Middle Ages, people didn't know much about Islam and Quran. It's not like today where we have the internet connecting us in this global way. Or even back in the 70s eras when you could send information by mailing cassettes here and there. We might think that they, they didn't know anything and that whatever they knew was based on ignorance and misunderstanding. And certainly there is some of that, but it turns out, surprise, surprise, that the Quran was a bestseller in medieval Europe and Middle, e Middle Ages. It was translated at least six times, which doesn't seem like a lot anymore, but if you think about the Middle Ages as everything, you know, everything was slower than it is now. And these translations, according to the experts, were fairly decent. There are 40 manuscripts that have survived until now, and that doesn't seem like a lot. But at the time, in the Middle Ages, the richest monasteries had maybe only 40 books total. It wasn't like Middle Ages in the Arab world where they, where they had tons and tons of libraries and bookstores around the cities with hundreds of books. There was a French translation in 1647 that was repeated again and again, and the English version had two editions a year. So by the 16th century, wealthy collectors were interested in having the manuscripts embossed with their name in gold leaf as an exotic collector's item to impress their friends. One of the scholars said it was a bit like an American owning and reading the Communist Manifesto during the Cold War, the book of an enticing but frightening other. And in fact, it was a dangerous book to print and sell. In Catholic Europe during the Spanish Inquisition in 1511, it was forbidden to have a copy of the Quran. In Switzerland in 1543, the first Latin translation that was printed, the person who did that, Johannes Operanus, was imprisoned briefly. And the guy who sold the first English translation in 1649, whose name was John Stevenson, was arrested and the book was seized. It must have been an experience uh, a bit like in contemporary communist China where, where it's uh, illegal to be um, Muslim, basically. Next slide, please. So we might think that this great interest in the Quran in this popular commercial world made it the center of intellectual attention, but it turns out that scholarly attention was marginal because the scholars at the time were focused on biblical studies, especially in Northern Europe, because Islam seemed very far away and not very relevant. So there was little interest in false scripture, except for those who were in Southern Europe and Christians living in the Muslim societies. They obviously had a great interest and were reacting more. Until 1453, when the Turkish armies conquered Constantinople, and then the Northern European scholars started to pay more attention. Next slide, please. We might think that being a neighbor to Muslims would make interpretation and empathy with the fellow believers more likely and more tolerant. So were the Christians who were living as minorities in Muslim empires producing nice translations and good books? But it turns out that they were not. Much like you will find Muslims today living in Canada but preaching that this is a toxic environment and that Western values are bad, it turns out that the first Christian polemic, which means attack against Islam, was written by St. John of Damascus. Next slide, please. He was born in around 675 or 6 uh, AD. He died near his monastery near Jerusalem in 749. So, of course, you can tell by the name, St. John of Damascus. His father held a high hereditary public office as chief financial officer for the Umayyad Caliph 
Abdul Malik. When his father died, St. John of Damascus succeeded him and was appointed chief counselor of Damascus. He wrote a two volume work, which is considered to be monumental and still looked at today, I believe, called The Fount of Knowledge. One of these volumes was called Heresies in Epitome, how they began and whence they draw their origin. So a heresy is basically an idea to have an idea that's considered to be wrong by general custom. And epitome means the best example. So the best example of wrong opinion. And he was talking about the Quran and Muhammad. St. John of Damascus called Muhammad immoral, a false prophet and a Christian heretic. He said the Quran was ridiculous, a corrupted version of the Bible. And by this, he initiated themes about Muhammad and Islam and the Quran that lasted for centuries. This idea of Islam as a Christian heretical sect, not seen the way we understand faith today as this faith and this faith and this faith, its own thing. But basically, from inside the Christian faith, somebody had gone off and established a heretical sect. That's what they thought um, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had done. Next slide, please. So why were these Christian scholars studying and interested in the Quran? Why do Muslims study it? Well, because we believe it's the word of God and we study it because we want guidance. It's guidance for the believer. Even if it was only on the margins then, why would a Christian scholar study it? And I'm going to tell you that four reasons, but I'm only going to discuss and elaborate two of those. So the first one is that you defend your own tradition by attacking another group. In fact, we find Muslims doing this today by to defend Islam, they will attack the West and say what's wrong with the West. And by doing that, they're trying to say what's good about themselves. So these Christian scholars were doing something similar. The second reason is that they wanted to control the meaning for curious outsiders. You think this is an interesting book, eh? Let me tell you what it's really about. The third reason is to understand the Quran for the mission of converting Muslims to Christianity. And fourthly, by the 1400s, with the rise of humanism and the Renaissance, biblical scholars actually believed that the study of Arabic and the Arabic Quran would help them understand the Hebrew Bible, partly because of this idea that the Quran had been cut and pasted uh, from the Bible. Above all, we can see how Quranic uh, interpretation is discussed and connected to the geopolitical events of the day between the Muslim empires and Christendom. The Crusades encouraged hostile interpretation of Muhammad and the Quran. The fall of Acre, for example, which was a Christian, uh, Christian part of Palestine for over 100 years in 1291, was uh, part of that. The spread of the Ottoman Empire, which was pushing up into Europe, created a great fear and they called them the Turks, were seen as a menace and their culture and their religion too. But I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on two things. One is the theme of conversion, converting the Muslims. And the second one is controlling the meaning. So next slide, please. In 1140, up in northern Europe, an abbot in the Benedictine Abbey of Cluny in France called Peter the Venerable decides it's time to cut away all the myth and folklore about Islam and Muhammad and the Quran and to study Islam based on its own sources. He wrote to a leader in northern France of the Benedictine uh, monks and said, it's time that someone dealt with this pernicious sect we might think that to study the Islam in its own sources is actually a good idea, that it might lead to more tolerant and empathetic understanding of the faith. Uh, but as you can tell by what um, Peter wrote to Bernard, let's deal with this pernicious sect. He didn't have a good motive for wanting to study Islam in its own sources. This idea of looking at the text or the religion in its own sources bubbles in the background for about 800 years or so. And I think we could say that it's really bearing fruit in today's contemporary interfaith 
movement. But Peter the Venerable had a spiteful motive, as you know, as I said. He wanted to resist Islam and to silence heresy, to, quote, show it through its writings and arguments to be detestable and damnable. I always pronounce that word wrong, damnable. So in 1142, Peter the Venerable travels to Spain, which was uh, Muslim Spain at the time, most of it, Andalusia. And he met translators that he commissioned for the project. Robert of Ketton was the main translator, Peter of Toledo, who planned and annotated, Peter of Poitiers, who did the final Latin version. The team included a friend called Herman of Corinthia, and apparently there was a Muslim named Muhammad who helped them. Robert of Ketton was in Spain to study Greco-Arabic science and mathematics, much like the Muslims in the 1800s sent intellectual people over to Europe to study the science and technology uh, because the, the, the West had, had advanced over them. They, there was a belief that you could study the science and technology and separate the faith and the culture from that study. And during that time, Al Andalusia was like, uh, you know, the MITs and the Cambridge and the Harvard of today. So people would go there to study, but they weren't interested in the religion, of course, just the science and mathematics. But nevertheless, Peter the Venerable thought that Robert of Ketton was qualified to do this translation. He set to work and produced over two years the first translation of the Quran into Latin, 1141 to 1143. Now, Robert of Ketton knew that Quranic Arabic was considered to be the highest, you know, very elevated form of Arabic. So he aimed for the same. He aimed to produce a Latin translation that was in high Latin, Assalamu alaikum. We're just experiencing some technical difficulties. So as Dr. Kathy Bullock uh, gets back on, uh, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to uh, send them in the, the, the comments. Uh, we'll have them broadcasted here and Dr. Kathy Bullock will address them towards the end of our session. Um, again, Jazakallah Khair for joining us. Uh, IIT actually does have some great sessions, both on demand uh, and live sessions. And you can find them on the YouTube page. You can also find them on the Facebook page. Um, and I really encourage you to, to, start, uh, to start participating in these sessions, um, similarly to how you would participate at IIT and come out to our programming. Um, we're trying to put out some very high quality programming, connecting with uh, with a variety of different guests uh, across Ontario. One of the positives about uh, about this uh, pandemic that we're in is that we have access to quite a number of people without them actually having to come to our location. So um, take a look at some of the programming that we have. I would also encourage you to take a look at some of the, the older classes that we've hold in the, held and the elder older programs that we've also held. They're all on the YouTube page, um, the Islamic Institute of Toronto YouTube page. Um, and they are in the process of being organized. So feel free to take a look at the courses that we have um, and the sessions that we, we've run. All of them are on the YouTube page right now. Also for this year, our, our courses are actually free. So uh, because of uh, everybody's at home and we really want people to be able to have access to our courses, our courses are all free. Um, and so you can register online. Um, you can also uh, view them on the YouTube page. Uh, we also have some courses that are interactive and that, you know, have a, a learning system. So they will have things like quizzes or, you know, where you can do some interaction with some shuyu. So feel free to check our courses online at www.islam.ca uh, as well as on the YouTube uh, channel. Um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, to send them in the comment box um, and we'll have them broadcasted. Um, so just a couple of reminders for today, and I'll repeat them towards the end of the program as well. Um, our Dua to Power Your Day course is now uploaded as a course. And if you go to the IIT website um, or open-thinkific, 
open-institute.thinkific.com. You can find this online as well on islam.ca. You'll be able to access that course. Uh, we also have a full catalog of courses on demand uh, uh, through the, through again, through the IIT website. So if you go to islam.ca, you'll be able to find those. Um, and we do have courses every Monday, uh, at Monday to Thursday at 8 p.m. So if you log in at 8 p.m., you'll be able to, to access our courses um, on a variety of different topics. Um, again, feel free to uh, ask any questions um, if you have them. We're just waiting for Dr. Kathy. Well, there are just a couple of, uh, of technical difficulties. Uh, there was a question about the book's names, please. Um, so one of the books that we're going to be talking about, this specific, uh, well, this specific session is actually on Dr. Kathy Bullock's book. And I'll give you the name of the book. Um, it is um, Western Discourses in the Quran. Uh, I believe there is an article on Dr. Kathy on 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 this topic by Dr. Kathy Bullock. Uh, but we will be posting all of the different books as they uh, as they come come along. Oh, it looks like we have Dr. Kathy Bullock joining us again. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Jazakallah khair. Well, yeah, I can, I'm very sorry about that. I, I I have this problem with my internet. It does go down, but hopefully it'll be the last time tonight, inshallah. inshallah. All right, so if we can go back to the slides, if you don't mind, thanks. I was telling you about Robert of Ketton. Uh, he went to remarkable lengths to try to paraphrase uh, what he thought the true sense of the text was. And he even consulted the Hadith and the Tafsir. One of the reasons that he did this was he wanted to get the translation right. The aim was to convert, and if there were inaccuracies in, inaccuracies in the translation, it would be easily dismissed. So that would endanger the whole project. But, like I said, the team, his employer, weren't in, um, aiming to do anything good or kind to Islam. In fact, Robert of Ketan called Islam a death-dealing religion. The translation title was called Lex Muhammad Pseudo-Prophet, which means Muhammad the Pseudo-Prophet's law. Pseudo means false, so the false prophet's law. Robert of Ketan's translation became the most widely read and it survives today in some 20 evil, medieval and early modern manuscripts. It would be printed in book form, not manuscript form, in 1543 and 1550. Robert of Ketan's translation became the basis for other translations. So there was an Italian version in 1547. From the Italian version, the first German translation in 1616. From the German translation, the first Dutch translation in 1641. So you, you can see the chain Latin to Italian to German to Dutch over the span of 500 years. Peter the Venerable put this translation together in a collection with other works and they're known as the Corpus Tolidanum from Toledo, which was part of Muslim Spain at the time. Peter wrote a history of the Muslims, which is called the summary of all the heresy and diabolical sect of the Saracens or Ishmaelites. And I'll tell you in a moment why Muslims were called Saracens, but the summary of all the heresy and the diabolical sect. And there was a letter written by an Arab Christian called the Apology of Al Kindi, meant to persuade Muslims to convert to Christianity. Peter the Venerable also wrote other works on Islam, one of the most important being the Liber Contra Sectum Siva Heresinum Saracenorum, meaning the refutation of the sect or the heresy of the Saracens. Again, portraying Islam as a Christian heresy. Next slide, please. This image is from a little bit later on than Peter the Venerable. It's uh, not very clear, I think, on my screen anyway, but it shows angels trampling Muhammad while he clutches a Quran, and it's on display in a church in Belgium, carved in the 1600s. So the aim of the translations, what were they trying to do? 
they were trying to control the meaning of the sources. So much like today, you hear a radio commentator or a hostile anti-Muslim evangelist or secular say that the Quran really says this. Muslims say this about the Quran, but the Quran really says this. You'll find, for example, feminist scholars who say the Quran doesn't really say anything about wearing hijab. So this is an attempt to control the meaning. Other scholars tried their hand after Robert of Ketton. And I'll just tell you some of them. <clears throat> Mark of Toledo, who was a Spanish physician in 1210, did the first word for word. So we're used to, we know some programs do word for word Arabic English. So he did the first word for word Latin translation. It was never printed and it was less widely read than Robert's. Flavius Mithridates in Rome in 1480, a humanist scholar, did the first Arabic and Latin in parallel columns. We're, of course, familiar with English and Arabic, so he did the first Latin Arabic in parallel columns. It was apparently heavily illuminated and a very beautiful volume, not a very good translation, written for rich people to display. 1453, Zwan de Segovia produces the first translation into a European language. So he had Arabic, he had Latin, and then the Castilian, which was the Spanish at the time, in three columns on the same page. And he had a Muslim that he employed to produce the, uh, the Arabic uh, to Latin. Sorry, to do the Latin to the Castilian. Arabic to Castilian. Then we have a scholar in 1518 in the Renaissance producing a new Latin translation of side-by-side -side text, Arabic and Latin. The first modern version is produced in 1698 by Louis Maracci. Now, all of these translations, which doesn't seem like a lot by today's standards, but at that time, remember, everything was like slowed down. This is a lot of work that's going on. The attempt, again, of all these people was to get the translation right. There was rarely an attempt to insert a false interpretation to support Christian doctrine. I mentioned that they consulted tafsir and hadith. Some had Muslims employed. This is the beginnings of what we might call objective scholarship, but all of them's aim was to refute Islam. How did they do this then? They're producing an accurate translation how are they then controlling the meaning if they're not putting in fake stuff? They did it in several ways. First of all, by the introductions that would accompany the book. The book you are about to read is, you know, blah, 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 terrible and pernicious. They did it with illustrations. They did it by changing the titles of the surahs and extensive notes in the margins. So remember, this is before printing. This is during the manuscript era. So they would write the translation in usually black ink and then in the sides, in the margins, in red ink or underneath the translation, basically notes inside, the text often in red. That's when they would do their commentary. Or they would use the translation like Peter had done to produce other works that refute and attack Islam. I'm going to give you some examples of this in detail from Robert F. Ketton's translation. So next slide, please. We see here an illustration. This is meant to be of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a fish. He was described as a monstrous fish with a human head. This fish image, the, which is the image of the seductive siren, recalls the idea of the uh, mermaids at the time who would lure the sailors to them by their beautiful sound. Uh, and then the sailor would die in, uh, on the rocks. So this image of Muhammad as luring people basically to death. Robert of Ketton reordered the surahs and renamed some of them. For example, Surah Luqman, he called, this is how he named it, quote, enveloped in absurd lies and the characteristic repetition of incantation. That was the title he gave Surah Luqman. He wrote the word liar all over the place or extremely stupid. In Surah Baqarah, verse 230, where it talks about divorce, Robert writes next to it, a most foul law. 
in Surah, in Surah 3 where it's talking about gold, Robert writes, he, meaning Muhammad, steals this from the gospel. Remember the idea that Muhammad had cut and pasted the, the gospel into this new book? So Robert writes, he steals this from the gospel. When it comes to the Quranic criticisms of Christians for, for saying that Jesus is the son of God, Robert writes next to it, here he, meaning Muhammad, here he says, as he often does, that the Jews did not kill Christ, but rather someone unknown but similar to him, and that God has no son among the typical insanities. Next to Surah 33, he wrote, vain, stupid, and impious. Next to Surah 52, he wrote, Moses was telling off people for worshipping the calf. Note the ridiculous lie. Another time he wrote, a most stupid fable follows about God and Adam and the angels and the devil, and I do not know where he found it. Remember that idea that he cut and paste? So Robert writes, I do not know where he found it, this stupid fable. Next to descriptions of paradise, he writes, not, notice the stupidity everywhere. So the problem then in Western discussion of the Quran is not its accuracy or inaccuracy, in translation but rather what the translation was for how it was meant to be used next slide please <coughs> this is a picture of the people who were called the saracens besieging a crusaders tower i'm going to talk now about three themes of the christian polemics polemics is a word that means attack against something and I'm going to talk about three things. So one, who did they think Arabs were? Two, why did they think Islam rose up? And who was Prophet Muhammad according to them? So the first one is they considered Arabs to be the descendants of Ishmael, who was the, we know, you know, Prophet Ishmael, the child of Hagar, Hagar, Hajar. The Christians knew him, Ishmael, as the wild man of the desert, so at the time, the desert was seen to be a place of chaos and disorder. And so the idea that Ishmael was in the desert meant that he was a wild man and his descendants were wild men. Now, the Muslims were called Saracens for a long time. And there are two explanations I found. It's either from a Roman word, from a Greek word, Sarek Noi, meaning an Arab tribe in Sinai. But St. John of Damascus himself claims that Saracen means not of Sarah. So Sarah was the legitimate wife of Abraham, according to the Christians, peace be upon him. And Ishmael was not of Sarah, so he was not of the legitimate wife. And that was therefore uh, a black mark against Ishmael and his descendants. And that's why they were called Saracens. Next slide, please. Why did Islam rise up? This is an image of a work that's called heretic because Islam was seen as a Christian heretical sect cobbled together by a false prophet who had cut and pasted pieces of the New Testament and Old Testament together under the guidance of a heretical Aryan monk or a heretical Nestorian monk. Why was this happening? They asked themselves and the answer was God is punishing us for our sin and he's brought up this heretical sect to challenge us much the same way that some Muslims have argued that colonialism and European control of the Middle East was God's punishment for Muslims leaving the true path. So the Christians considered Islam a punishment for Christian sin. They circulated various stories about Muhammad, peace be upon him. The earliest biography is comes from a monk, a Byzantine monk who was in Constantinople in 760 called the Conographia. It was written around 815. It was translated into Latin in 870 and became the basis of several monastic biographies in the 12th century. So in this biography by Theophanes, he claimed that the Jews had flocked to Muhammad thinking he was the long-awaited Messiah, but they found him eating camel meat, which for the Jews is a forbidden food. But some of them were so afraid of Muhammad that they stayed on as his followers. 
Theophany says that Muhammad had epileptic seizures and to have an epileptic seizure for many uh, decades up until the 18th century, it was considered to be a symptom of possession by a demon. And his wife Khadija was frightened, so he didn't want to tell her that he was being possessed by a demon. He was telling her that he was visited by the angel Gabriel. Khadija takes him to a heretical monk who tells him he's a prophet. The Afrinese biography mocks Muhammad for creating a paradise, quote, full of profligacy and stupidity, which means it talks too much about eating, drinking and uh, intimate relations between husband and wife. The Afrinese biography produces several themes that continue right up until the 1800s. The first one was him as an epileptic, which I mentioned already. The second one was of Muhammad as a magician or a trickster who performed false miracles. What would he do? He would put milk and honey in the mountains and then he would tell his people, oh, let's go to the mountains. And he would find milk and honey and he would say, oh, my God, isn't this a miracle? And the people believed him. In the Middle Ages, the idea of the dove was that it was an angel that came to give revelation. And so Muhammad is said to have put seeds in his ear and trained the dove to come and peck the seeds. And by this, then he pretended that the angel Gabriel in the form of a dove was giving him revelation. And this is how he tricked people. And lastly, that he lived an oversexed lifestyle and a paradise to attract followers. And uh, this is a PG event, so I can't tell you some of the stories and descriptions of this paradise uh, that was meant to attract the followers. They're quite graphic. There are other stories that he had been a cardinal in the Catholic Church. He'd wanted to become Pope and he wasn't given the Pope and he got really upset so he split off and created this crippled version of Christianity. The, he was a pseudo-prophet and some even considered him either to be the forerunner of or the actual Antichrist. Safrela. In the 11th century, the idea that Muslims were pagans and they worshipped a trinity that was called Termagant, which had three members, Muhammad, Apollo and Termagant. Now, all of these stories reminds us of the Quraysh reactions to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They also called him a magician and a liar and a madman. Next slide, please. So I'm going to finish up with this last section. And if any of you are feeling offended by what I've told you, and I won't be surprised if you are because it's quite an offensive journey and story, I just want to invite you to consider three things. In the you know, entirety of human history, apart from the modern times, the efforts through the interfaith dialogue movement, in, in fact, it's very rare not to mock and ridicule the scripture of another faith. Christian scholars were interpreting the Quran through the lenses of the, of the Bible, of their belief system. Muslim scholars were doing similar things in the Middle Ages, interpreting the Bible through the lenses of the Quran. One of the things that upsets the Christian scholars, even to this day, uh, about Islamic claims was the denial of the Trinity, denial of the ascension of Jesus to heaven, and the claim that the Bible is a corrupted version of the gospel. Muslim scholars have also written books against Christian scriptures, so I'm going to give you some examples. Ibn Hazm of Cordoba in 1064 wrote a book against the Bible called The Separator Concerning Religions, Heresies and Sects. This book calls Christians stupid, irrational, frivolous, impious, lying, obstinate, blindly submissive to authority, uh, avaricious, inferior and theologically extremist. A work attributed to Al-Ghazali around the 1100s is called The Fitting Refutation of the Divinity of Jesus Through What is Evident in the Gospel. In 1220, Al-Qurtabi wrote a book called Information About the Corruptions and the Delusions of the Religion of the Christians. 
and Ibn Taymiyyah in the late uh, 1200s wrote something called the correct answer to those who have changed the religion of Christ. So to finish off, tonight I began talking about how interested the early medieval and early modern people were at least at the level of commoners were in the Quran and how it could actually be a dangerous interest. I talked about how the early translators were interested in attacking the Quran and Muhammad as a way to defend and protect Christianity. How some of this came from those who were closest to Muslims in the Muslim empires. I talked about how the translators made an effort to translate well and properly, even consulting the tafsir and hadith, but not out of what we would recognize as an objective interest in learning, but rather in getting it right, the better to defend and attack and also in getting it right, the better to try to convert Muslims to Christianity. My most important message that I want to share with you tonight is actually not this history, but what we should do about this history now in the decade of the 21st century. And I'm going to make three points. The first one is that I think we should learn to be what's called magnanimous, learn to overlook it, be careful of how we react to this history. The history of the Quran translation and discussion of the Quran is uh, surprisingly hostile. It, it wasn't necessary to be like that, and it's a lesson in how not to do it. Secondly, I don't want this history to feed a radicalized anti-Western narrative that can exist and grow in our own community. Wanting to prove another faith wrong and your own faith is correct is normal and natural, I'm not saying that I believe that we should, you know, say all faiths are the same or something like that. I'm not saying that we shouldn't explain our faith and show its differences and how we personally might think that it's better, but that we have to do so wisely and without being hostile and attacking. So finally, to propel us then to a new contemporary model of interfaith relations of which there are many efforts and attempts over the last few years or last decade probably all over Canada and the US we have to show our, uh, we we have to reflect the verse of the Quran that I read at the beginning verse 2946 and in case I'm not being clear I'm going to restate it again I believe that the Quran is the word of God revealed to the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him the last revelation sent by Allah the Quran teaches that the Jews and Christians changed the message of the original Torah and the gospel that Prophet Moses and Jesus, peace be upon him, had brought. So I'm not trying to say anything about this Quranic message that says it's come to correct the earlier religious texts that were written down by people. What am I trying to say then is that we should not feel offended when other faiths who also interpret Islam through their own texts because Muslim scholars have written similar books. I'm saying we need to be careful how we react to this history of Quranic in, in translation. The Quran balances its teaching about the corruptions of earlier texts with instructions to Muslims that we be kind to the people of the book, we be good to the people of the book. The Sharia gave respect and freedom of religion and rights to the pe people of the book. It doesn't teach we persecute or oppress them. The Quran says we have to be careful how we respond to another group of faith. And I believe that world peace requires good relations between Christians and Muslims. The verse that I opened with today, and do not argue with the people of the scripture except in a way that is best. And I will finish then with another surah in chapter 16, the bees, surah Nahl, verse 125, which says, quote, Invite all to the way of your Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. Argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. For your Lord knows best who has strayed from his path and who receives guidance. And Allah knows best. Anything good that I have said is from Allah. Anything bad is from me and shaitan. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. 
Well, well, I think with some, uh, Dr. Kathy Bullock, she's not going to for joining us. Uh, we really do appreciate you taking time out of your day to uh, join us here with the Islamic Institute of Toronto. Um, are there any questions from the floor uh, before we close? Before we close. They should appear on the screen if there are any questions from the floor. Okay, Jazakallah Khair. Uh, it doesn't seem like there are any questions. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, we really do appreciate this. Uh, this session will actually be uh, on, our, uh, on our YouTube page. Um, so it will be available um, for later on if you'd like to go back to, to, to review some of, the, um, some of the content that Dr. Kathy Bullock covered today. Um, in terms of um, our sessions uh, with the Islamic Institute of Toronto, um, this session called Great Books of Islamic Civilization actually happens once a month. Previous recorded sessions on this topic can be found on the YouTube channel, including reviews of books such as Tafsir ibn Kathir, Al Muwafaqat, Bidayat al Mujtahid, Fath al Bari, The Muwatta of Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan, and more. Um, we also have many guest speakers, uh, along with Dr. Kathy Bullock, uh, covering this, this, these topics, uh, including Dr. Jasser Auda, Dr. Muhammad Fadil, Dr. Hassan Ansari, Sheikh Abdul Hamid, and Imam Yusuf Badat. So I encourage you to uh, look at the content. Um, that we have. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Kathy Bullock, for joining us. Uh, and inshallah, we will see you again on one of our sessions. Yeah, thank you. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum, salam alaikum.